for, how Kepler is used, etc. I'd be happy to answer that one. Um, basically, one of the things that we are doing is, is determining these frequencies, how many, around how many stars, what type of stars, because there will be follow-on missions. And follow-on missions need this kind of information for their design. There are a couple of designs out there. One is a, is a coronagraphic kind of approach. Another one is a big interferometer. And they have different uh, areas of, of uh, application. And so one of the things that we're doing in some sense is providing the information required for the future missions that will go out and find the planets nearest and the nearest stars as well as going out and finding the composition of the atmospheres of these planets, and that is another step toward our exploration of the galaxy. Let me just do a quick check for, looks like we have one more here. Hello, I'm Paul Workman with Canadian Television. Um, a general question, first of all, how much does this bring us closer to um, discovering whether there's alien life? And second, how do you now find out if the five planets in the habitable zone uh, do have life? Patience. That's how it's done. Uh, and lots of money. Uh, that's reality. Uh, this mission is designed to do something and do it as well as can be for this first step. It finds the frequency of these objects, these planets, and their distribution. But you must do the other steps. You must in some sense, build the cathedral. The first generation is going to build the foundation. The next generation is going to build the walls. Third generation is going to put the ceiling on. The fourth generation is going to enjoy it. And so we are, in some sense, the first generation. We're finding them. The second generation is going to build instruments of far more complexity than what we have to go and find these nearby ones. And even greater demands are going to be made to find the atmospheres on these planets. And then, of course, having done that, our grandchildren will have to decide what's the next step. Do they want to go there, send a robot, robotic system there? So this is only one step. It's an important step, but there are other steps that must follow. Great. I'd like to go to the phones now, if we're ready. Um, I believe Seth Bornstein from the Associated Press is on. So, Seth, go ahead. Yes, thank you for doing this. Um, this is more for Bill. In, of the 54 in the, um, potent candidates in the habitable zone, I think you said one was Earth size or actually smaller than the Earth, and four were super Earth. Uh, does that mean essentially that the other 49 are more candidates, as you say, for, um, the, uh, for, for satellites, for moons? Or are, is there a group that is uh, sort of in the range that could that might have be rocky. And the other question is, what, uh, I know definitions uh, for habitable zones vary. What is your temperature definition? Is it zero to 100 C, or is it slightly bigger? Thank you. Yes, Seth. Uh, the, uh, the temperature range that we consider part of the habitable zone is, is extended in that clearly if you extend it down below the freezing point of water, uh, that's the ca what we calculate if the planet has no atmosphere. If the planet does have an atmosphere, the temperature is certainly going to be warmer than that. It may be very well to have, <coughs> have liquid uh, on its surface. The, the habitable zone is a very fuzzy concept. Uh, certainly Enceladus and other moons that are very far out, but are heated by the internal energy of their moons. Uh, you know, it's, it's, there's possible possibilities of life there as well. We're just trying to pick a region that... Uh, has a higher probability of having life, sort of a start uh, in, in, in the search. Did that answer your question? And Oh, you asked about the other ones as well. We, we have these five that are, that are small, nine-tenths the size of the Earth, up to twice the size of the Earth, a group that are Neptune size, and a small number of the order of half a dozen or a dozen that are Jupiter size. And... Uh, Clearly, all of those are interesting to us. We will want to explore them further, but we don't know much more about them than we've told you at this point. We have a lot of work to do to better understand them and to confirm them. Okay, uh, let's go back to the phones, uh, this time with David Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. Go ahead, David. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I have a question for uh, Bill, I guess, and that is how do you define a candidate and when does a candidate not be a candidate anymore, but be something confirmed. 
That's a very good, tough question in that, of course, when we see a series of transits, the first thing you'd like to say is, oh, that's a planet. Uh, more, light, more than likely, it's going to be an eclipsing binary or maybe some galactic cosmic rays that hit your detector or a lot of other phenomena. One of the ones that we are the most troublesome with are the eclipsing binary stars. When we look out in the galaxy, we see not just our target, but lots of stars in the background, lots of these little red M dwarfs that are everywhere. And if they're an eclipsing binary, the instrument thinks it's seeing the target star vary. So we go through a great deal of effort for each of these objects that look interesting. Our analysis pipeline uh, pro provides a beautiful example of all the threshold crossing events, events that have a big enough signal to be interesting. It looks at these, uh, and the pipeline looks at these and asks, is there a secondary eclipse? That's a warning right away that this is a star. It looks at the shape, and if it's V-shaped, it's a warning right away this is probably an eclipsing binary. So the analysis pipeline that our team has put together has built a system that eliminates most of these false positive events. And the, some of the tests, some of the work they've done is absolutely elegant. Nevertheless, after they process the data for four months, it comes to the science team, uh, uh, basically of observers and, and, and others, and we look at these and ask, which of these can we go to the telescope with and have a chance of proving their planet? We look with uh, ground-based telescopes and ask, are there other stars really close in that could explain this? We look at, the, uh, the, we do reconnaissance spectra with our observers to see what the characteristics of the star are. If you don't know the size of the star, you don't know the size of the planet. So we make an effort to get at the size of the star through reconnaissance spectra. And then if it still looks good, we want to confirm it. We go to the biggest telescopes in the world, the Keck's and the HETs and the Nordic Optical Telescopes, and go and measure the radio velocity fluctuations. So it's a series of steps that generally takes from when the data comes down from the spacecraft to when we have a, an announcement, generally of the order of a year. That's the kind of time that's required be, to be able to prove something is a planet. You know, so, I'd, just like well, to, I'd just like to jump in and, and say, you know, you listened to, to, uh, uh, to Bill's description there, and it should give you a better understanding of the fact uh, of just how much work goes into dubbing something, up, uh, taking something from planet, exoplanet candidate to exoplanet. Uh, I, I, everybody wants to be able to, you know, just go through and, and roll out hundreds of planets. But each and every one of these require this sort of, uh, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, painstaking work to go through and, uh, and confirm that they actually are planets and not something out there trying to trick us into thinking it's a planet. So, I, I mean, it's, uh, it, it, Bill gave a good description there, and you should kind of think about that because it's, it's an amazing amount of work by a lot of people that's going into this. I just like to add, Bill did an excellent description, and all the steps before the last were basically doing for every candidate before we'd even consider calling it a planet. But there are three different last steps because those radial velocities Bill mentioned, the Doppler method, that works for big enough planets orbiting close enough in around bright enough stars. But for Kepler-11, they're too small. They're not r super close in. And they're around a fairly faint star. And so the second method is one that's only been used twice for Kepler-9 and Kepler-11. And that's, as Bill mentioned in his talk, the transit timing variations to see the tug that they're exerting on one another. And you can't have that in triple star systems because they would go unstable. The stars are much more massive. So that's the second way, which like the radial velocity method, also gives you the mass. But it's only on systems where the planets are big enough or close enough that it's possible. So the third method, which we've just used on a couple of objects, one 
the third, pla the third planet around Kepler 9 and 1, the sixth planet around Kepler 11, is to look painstakingly at the field right around the star and look at characterize the star as much as we can and look at the details of the shape of the planet and show that the shape and the details of it just don't make sense for any false positive model with any reasonable chance of occurring. And therefore, we're more than 99% certain it's a planet, and we call it a planet. And that's better than the rates of things that have been called planets in the past, so we think that's pretty good. And if it's not at 99%, at least, it's still just a candidate. Anything else to add? Okay. Uh, I know we have one more question, at least on the phone. Let me take that, and then we'll come back to the audience and just do a quick check to see if there are any further. Uh, Kelly Beatty, Sky and Telescope. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, Jack, in assuming, in, in concluding that uh, some of these have atmospheres, you, you've, as I understand, you've basically been working uh, on a model fit to their densities. When you measure these transits and the transit times, if there are atmospheres around, how do the atmospheres affect the uh, the diameters that you derive? Do, do, the, do the atmospheres cause you to come up with a diameter that's artificially larger than the planet itself? Well, you, you have a good question. And what is the size of the planet? For Earth, you generally consider the size of the solid surface because then the atmosphere is just so much more tenuous. But for giant planets in our solar system, we have to say, what is the size where we want to cut things off? And we have to say that for these planets, too. And it turns out that the size at which a, the, the altitude, the density in the atmosphere that causes a transit is a little bit less dense, so a little bit higher, so get a little larger than what we would call the measurements of the sizes of say, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or Neptune. But it's by less than 1% in those cases. It may be a little more in these cases, but it's a, it's a pretty small difference. Great. Let me just do a quick check in the audience, see if there are any further questions. Okay, we'll go to the phone line. We have Nell Greenfield Boyce from NPR. Go ahead. One more time, do we have Nell on the line? Okay, uh, I think, let me just do one more check, see if there are any further questions. All right, so I know we have a question from Ames Research Center. Let's go there. Go ahead, Ames. Okay, hello. Uh, Jens Ergon, Swedish National Television. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit more on these five uh, almost Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone. I mean, what could you tell? I mean, what kind of stars do they circle? How far away are they? What might they look like? And uh, furthermore, I mean, if, if you wouldn't characterize these like Earth-like planets, uh, I mean, when, what, what is the definition for an Earth-like planet then? And when might these Earth-like planets pop up? Uh, would they exist? That's a very, very hard question. We, we, can, we can measure these. We can detect them. We have yet to prove there are planets. Uh, they are, many of these are small, so we haven't confirmed any. But it's certainly going to be something we will investigate in the coming uh, months and years. But at this point, I can't tell you much about them other than uh, generally the stars they orbit are stars quite a bit smaller than the sun. Uh, of the order is sometimes uh, half the size of the sun. The temperatures are very much lower. Uh, the sun is about 5,800 Kelvin. These stars are almost half that temperature of the order of 3,000, 3,500. I think some of the uh, slightly bigger objects are around uh, stars, again, cooler than the, earth, uh, than the sun. 
but the temperatures, I think, run about 44 to 4,800 Kelvin, so they would be considered K-dwarfs, uh, stars intermediate between these very small, cool stars and the uh, hotter star like the sun. Uh, but I, uh, we don't know much more about them a as yet. Uh, we have discovered them, of course, only very, very recently. Uh, it takes a great deal of work to, to, uh, to find them, to make sure that we uh, understand a little bit about the, the star themselves. Uh, it's not... It's, it's difficult often just to get the information on the star. How big is it? What is its composition? Uh, so the reconnaissance spectra and the interpretation of the reconnaissance spectra, the understanding of how old the stars might be, which tells you a little bit about how mass and, and size vary for these stars, are things that we still have a lot of work to do. So I'm afraid I can't give you much information other than many of them are around the cooler stars, stars smaller than the sun. Uh, just to add a uh, couple things, uh, if they are planets and they are in the habitable zone, then the star that they see in the sky close up is a lot redder than our sun. And as Doug and Bill stated earlier, the reason the habitable planet, small habitable planet candidates we're seeing now are only around these small faint stars is we just haven't had enough time. We are searching for planets that are true Earth analogs, Earth size, around stars like the sun, but that's going to take a few more years of data to uh, find them. Okay, let's go back to Ames. We have another question. Go ahead. Uh, it's Mike Meacham with Aviation Week. You've had four months of uh, recorded observations out of, I think it's a three-year mission, so you're really just getting started here. I'm trying to get an idea of the results you expect. Will they be, do you expect that they could be linear in the sense of you've got 1,235 candidate um, planets now, or Will your early observations have you you started to see enough of the candidates that now you're getting into the fine grain detail, and will we won't see results uh, stepping forward as as great as these have been? That's that's right. I I mentioned in my talk that as you go further and further out to larger orbital uh, distances, larger orbital periods, the chance of getting an alignment falls dramatically. So we see this huge uh, um, number of candidates in the first four months of data. But if we look at the following years, we don't expect to see anywhere near that kind of increase. What we will see is fewer but more interesting uh, planets. They'll be the ones that are further out that are cooler. The other aspect that's happening here that uh, is, is that as we go on, the analysis that we do uh, to correct for the, the stars are very noisy. The stars are noisier than we expected. So it's harder to find these small signals. And we have a group of people uh, at NASA Ames that work very hard to correct out the noise and the glitches and things like that in the data. And as they do so, the analysis pipeline becomes more and more capable of finding these smaller objects. So we're going to find in the, in the years that are going on that we're able to find, even in the data that we're releasing right now, more planets, but they'll be smaller planets. to be buried in the noise. And so it's the a capability of our mathematical analysis that allows us to find these small objects, but we do not expect to see the kind of plethora uh, increase that we see now. There will be many fewer as the years go on. So quality is coming up, not quantity. <laughs> okay, let's go back to the phones. Uh, let's try Nell Greenfield Boyce at NPR again. Go ahead, Nell. Hi, can you hear me this time? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that glitch before. Thanks for doing this and thanks for taking my question. Do you all anticipate that the first confirmed um, uh, Earth-sized planet in a habitable zone will be one of these candidates? I mean, do you feel that uh, the Holy Grail, as was said before, is actually in these data waited, waiting to be confirmed? And I know you talked about some of the steps that are required for confirmation, but just to uh, reiterate, how long do you think that confirmation will take? Well, 
I guess I guess I can speak to that again. No, I wouldn't expect the Holy Grail, if you know, to use the the term that that I used, uh, to be in this set. Because again, the the Holy Grail and Earth sized planet are in the habitable zone around a sun like star. Uh, obviously, the orbital period of that would be about a year. So, in fact, you would only, if you were far away in the plane of the Earth's orbit looking at transits across the sun, you would only see a transit by that planet once every year. So, in fact, it would take you three years, you know, well, first off, it would take you two years before you even saw a second blip that, you know, sort of stood out in the middle of nowhere, you know, a year after the first one came along. And it would be a third before you came along and said, wow, you know, we seem to be getting this blip every year and that period. So, in fact, at this point, with only a year and a half worth of data, we wouldn't have enough blips yet to identify it as a recurring event. So, in that, in that instance, no, I would, I would say just on that standpoint, the, the planet candidate that could be our, uh, our Earth-like planet, uh, if you will, or the Earth-sized planet in the habitable zone, to be more precise, wouldn't have emerged from the data yet. Okay, we have Alan Boyle from MSNBC on the phone. Go ahead, Alan. Hi. Um, with the earlier data release, there were some candidates that were held back uh, for confirmation by the Kepler team, 400. Uh, I wondered if uh, there, are, uh, there are a number of candidates that are being held back this time for similar reasons. No. No, they're not. All the data, in, in addition to the the 400 targets that uh, the the team had ex, uh, extended exclusive use period so that they could have a full season of follow up observations, uh, were released uh, actually just a few hours before all of the data on the 156,000 for the uh, for the second three months of the mission. So all the data is out there. There are no uh, targets that have been held back at this point. And one of the things I think that we had an opportunity to do was to take a look at those uh, candidates that were held back uh, during the summer and do reconnaissance spectra of many of those, of the thousands, the 2,000, uh, I'm sorry, the 1,200 candidates. And we found that uh, some of those that we had released, some of those that we had reserved were in fact false positives, things that ultimately were eclipsing binaries or whatever. So the groups that we have released, that is all that we have released now, are much more heavily vetted. So we have a much better understanding that these are really good candidates. Go out, observe these, and you're going to find planets. And we have released all the data uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for this four months. We, of course, have data after that period of time, but we don't have any candidates that, that we can show you. Okay. Let's move on to Mike Wall of Space.com. Go ahead, Mike. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. So I saw in the like, like a little press, you know, the press release that that actually Kepler went into safe mode, and and I was just wondering if if you guys could just speak to what the problem was and if it's serious or or if everything is going to be okay going forward with the the telescope. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, the the Kepler spacecraft did turn up in uh, safe mode at the normal contact. Um, and the the uh, team is currently working the issue. Uh, it appears to be at this point, and this is preliminary information, uh, it appears to be a fault with one of the star trackers, which is something that we have experienced before. The data shows that the spacecraft is in fine shape. Uh, in fact, it's been brought out of safe mode and is in standby mode. And probably even as we speak here, they're doing a full download, download of the uh, mission data recorder so they can make sure that they know what's going on and, and find a uh, uh, see if we can design a way to avoid this problem in the future. But this does appear to be uh, a, a fault that we have experienced before, and we do not believe it represents any serious threat to the mission. Thanks. Uh, let's go back to Seth Bornstein, the Associated Press. Go ahead, Seth. 
Yes, thanks. I, I want to, if we could focus in on the uh, the smallest of planets. First, what is the smallest size you saw? And looking at the one Earth-sized one, uh, candidate in the potentially habitable zone, I believe that's a 0 0.6 Earth radii, uh, and, uh, radius, and I'm wondering if, uh, one, how secure are you about that? I mean, and 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 would because it's so small, would that um, eliminate using uh, radial velocity to to get it? And and I'm wondering, overall, how many planets have you found that are actually smaller than Earth? Thank you. Maybe Deborah can talk about uh, confirming these small objects with radial velocity. She's been working on a new system that may. Uh, represent a significant step forward in the ability of radio velocity systems to look at the smaller objects. Well, I can certainly comment that this is extraordinarily difficult, um, that the detection, our, our measurement errors right now are about one meter per second, and where to find an Earth analog, we would need to be able to measure an amplitude of reflex velocity in the star of 10 centimeters per second. So that means we've got to shrink our one meter per second error bars by a factor of 10. And uh, yeah, we're investigating. Uh, I mean, we have uh, at Yale a, a Doppler diagnostic facility where we're setting radial velocity precision as the figure of merit and really trying to hammer down on all of the error sources that we can think of. Uh, but uh, I, you know, I think we're ways away. The, maybe the best strategy we have right now is if our uh, errors are random, that's a big if, uh, and not systematic errors, then one way we can uh, shrink the error bar is by taking many observations. So you take one measurement, you get you know, one meter per second, you take 100, uh, you reduce that precision or improve that precision by the square root of the number of observations. So that's how you can get from one down to 10. Problem is that the, it doesn't really go down uh, that fast because our errors really aren't uh, completely uh, Gaussian or completely uh, uh, normally distributed. Um, so it's the focus of work. It's and and I, I think like everything in this field, we have to go you know stepwise, one step at a time. And it's 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 too bad we can't just sort of leap to the end and see the answers. But uh, we're all doing the hard uh, groundwork right, right now to try and make that happen. And I'd like to add that if we get lucky, and we find some Earth-sized candidates in the habitable zone of stars with more than one candidate. And if the spacecraft is healthy, stays healthy, funding stays healthy, and we can have an extended mission, maybe we'll be able to observe long enough that we'll be able to see transit timing variations that one planet causes on the other and confirm it that way, even if radial velocity confirmation is impossible for such a small planet. Okay, we're going to take the last question. This is back to David Perlman with the San Francisco Chronicle. Go ahead, David. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, I have to follow, try to follow up before. Uh, Bill, I'm still not clear as to how you define what is the definition of a candidate? I understand how you confirm it, and you all were very helpful on that subject, but how do you actually define a candidate that makes you then go and attempt to confirm it? Okay, that's, <clears throat> let's, let's talk about that for a moment. We have this analysis pipeline. It goes through the data in an automated fashion, and it finds any set of transits that have a signal-noise ratio like, like seven. The probability of getting something like that random and random data is one in a hundred billion. So you see that and you say, well, here, the, the pipeline produces it. It gives you a list of these things. This star has such and such events, threshold crossing events, uh, with this period, this amplitude, and it makes some checks, and it then spits this out, gives us a report, and the uh, the team that was called TESER, the Threshold Crossing uh, Events Team, looks at uh, the results of this computer output and then begins to, to think about it themselves. Do they believe this? Which do they, do they really think this is a candidate? Is the Threshold Crossing event a candidate? If the team looks at it and says yes, it becomes a candidate because they say it's a candidate. 
they make that decision. A group of about eight or ten people meet uh, generally once a week to make that decision. And it's that group then that uh, uh, puts a, a priority rank on these things and sends it to the group of people, what's called a follow-on observing program group, uh, FOP, who look at what's been given to them and see here is what TCERT wants us to look at. And they look and they, des they decide from the available telescopes, the instruments, and so on, which of these is the most practical to do. And then that, again, that's, a, that's still a candidate, and they go forward with the, uh, the validation procedures that we talked about. But the conversion of a threshold crossing event to a candidate is done by, a team, by team members meeting in a group once a week who make that decision by, observe, by looking at the data. And then, so Bill has described how something becomes a candidate, and it stays a candidate until either it's confirmed as a planet, or we show that it's a false positive. Right. Yes. Okay. With that, we'll end today's media conference. Um, just as a reminder, you can find out more information about today's announcements uh, and keep up with the latest on the hunt for planets at www.nasa.gov forward slash Kepler. I'd like to thank the panelists for their time today and thank all of you for joining us. Have a great day.